Morning Auto 2. So we're going to be getting, talking today about charging system. We're going to be looking at charging system fundamentals and we're going to get this camera set right there. There we go. Back up just a little bit. So I'm going to start off with basic charging system um, parts and what they are. And um, you can see on the screen um, that the car that we're looking at is actually an older school car. And the way you can pick up on that is you see the alternator there, and it's got a V-belt, so that tells you that it's kind of an older car. It's not a serpentine belt. It's also got a voltage regulator that's over here on the side uh, of the car. And notice they say older vehicle, and then newer vehicles in the back of the alternator. So I'm just getting you to look at that picture and say all those yellow parts are components that are involved and part of the charging system. So let's talk about the system parts. First, we've got an alternator. And an alternator is an AC generator, so it makes alternating current. Any device that makes electricity is a generator. So an alternator makes alternating electricity. Here's an older V-belt style. There's a more modern uh, serpentine belt style. Um, and you'll notice that the difference, one of the differences on this modern one, just visually, look at all the slots in here. So, and not so many here. So this one, by putting all those slots in there, we can reduce the weight of the alternator. We can also, there's a fan just inside the cover, whereas I used to put it on the outside. So another way you can identify this one's a newer. But with all those holes, it tends to blow a lot more air through so that this alternator, which makes a lot more power, this one probably made 30 to 60 amps. And now this one's making you know 80 to 120 amps or something like that. Um, this one, whenever we make more current, we need more cooling because current flowing will make heat. So just some ways in which we can compare fans inside, fans outside, V-belt pulley, serpentine belt pulley, all kinds of slots, not so many. But again, this kills weight, and that's going to help us with those CAFE standards or corporate average fuel economy uh, uh, economy standards that the federal government uh, requires. Next is the voltage regulator. So the voltage regulator is going to control the output of the alternator. And I've got two voltage regulators here, old school, fender mounted, external, outside the alternator, modern, internally regulated regulator that's inside an alternator. So for example, here's one right here in my hands. This is the diode trio and the regulator together. This part right here is the regulator, and you can immediately identify it because you see what's called the heat sink, the aluminum raised fins that are to get air blowing through there to cool off, and that's cooling off the transistors in here, which are the part or the components of the voltage regulator. Okay, we'll come back to this. So that's used to control the output of the alternator, both uh, voltage and current, and it's going to do it by controlling the magnetic field, which we'll talk about that in a bit. Alternator drive belt. So in this case, in the picture, we have a serpentine belt. And it's a crankshaft driven, the alternator's crankshaft driven. Um, old school V-belts um, versus serpentine belts. This one's even a little older now because this one has a spring-loaded uh, tensioner where we're seeing a lot of cars no longer, or many cars don't have spring-loaded tensioners anymore. Uh, Honda will have like a hydraulic shock. Um, Camrys do that, if I'm not mistaken. And then Subarus and some other cars now have a stretch to fit belt. Literally, you have to have a special tool. You stretch it on. When you go to change it, you just cut it and then use the tool to stretch a new one on. Not a lot of fun for technicians to get um, those, those new belts on and harder to reuse them to get them off and so on. But um, they do that because spring-loaded tensioners tend to make a fair amount of vibration. And even, even on some older Hondas, they would get misfire codes because of the vibration on the serpentine belt. Uh, there was a technical service bulletin in the late 90s, early new millennium on, on Hondas on that. Okay, So we have a charge indicator on the dash. If we have a dash warning icon, and I know this looks sort of orange or tan. It's supposed to be red. Unfortunately, it's not quite accurate. But the charge indicator you know, shows a picture of a battery, and remember that means that if that comes on, the battery is not being charged. It does not mean that we have a battery problem. It means that the battery is not being charged. So we have a charging system problem. Um, so modern cars will either have this dash warning icon or they'll have a voltmeter um, like this. And, you know, it'll 
put it up in here and down here you're too low, up here you're too high, and so we can have some sort of scale there. Really older cars had ammeters that looked at how much current it was flowing. We got away from this because we didn't want current in the dash. Um, so usually now, or now we either have a voltmeter on the dash or we have a battery charging system warning light. Next is our harness. And that you know that that's a group uh, typically of roughly 16 gauge, sometimes uh, 14 gauge uh, wires. And remember the gauge refers to the thickness of the wire or a cross-sectional diameter. The smaller the number, the, the, the larger the diameter. And these are all um, insulated, meaning they have a plastic coating on them and it's colored so you can find it on the wiring diagram and trace it through the car. So that's going to attach our alternator to the battery and other components in the car. Let me adjust this just slightly. Um, and it says next we have a battery. So our battery is um, going to be used to energize the alternator field to get the alternator charging. And um, that's really its main job when it comes to the charging system. Obviously, it's involved in cranking the engine and getting, initiating that four-stroke cycle. But when it comes to the alternator, it's going to energize the alternator's field, which is called the rotor. And once it starts energizing that rotor, um, once it gets this rotor right here energized, then the rotor is going to be self-energizing, meaning it creates power to keep itself energized. So the altar is used to initially get the rotor energized. Once that's energized, we are rolling along. And um, here's a rotor out of the alternator with its two slip rings, its common steel shaft, its alternating north-south pole claws, its uh, roll of, of approximately 16-gauge plastic-coated wire on the inside. Let's keep going here. Um, one other thing that it says, let me get my hammer to focus here. Sometimes when I step in front of it, it helps it. There you go. Is we're going to stabilize alternator output. So let's say you have a big stereo. The battery is going to stabilize alternator output because when that big bass hits and the sub hits, um, the subwoofer hits, it's going to, the initial bang is going to draw a lot of power. And a lot of times it can overwhelm the alternator. So the battery is going to help stabilize output by having additional current and voltage uh, or additional current available to help um, the energy needs of the car. So this slide shows a generator versus an alternator. And um, old school cars use generators. And generators um, were uh, larger. And um, if they made, uh, uh, you couldn't have a DC generator or an AC generator, but um, in any case, they were larger, they were heavier. The difference on the inside is that with a generator, what we call the generator, automotive DC generator, we held the magnetic field stationary and we spun a conductor. Think of this as like a coat hanger that's spinning in there. And when you spin a conductor in a magnetic field, you'll cause current flow in that conductor. In an alternator, we do the very opposite we spin the magnetic field and hold the conductor stationary and we get more electricity. We found this was a more efficient way. This makes better power at idle in particular um, and its maximum output is better. Generators went away in the mid 60s. I know you're thinking, why are we talking about them? Because they're still a thing, they're still out there and it's kind of uh, interesting to understand the, the basic differences between. Um, so let's talk about alternators. Um, in relationship to old school generators, they're more efficient. They make more power for a revolution. They're smaller and lighter than a generator. They're way more dependable. And they have more output at idle. By the way, I thought I would just show you an old school generator. They were kind of long like this. They had a fan on the outside. V-groove belt pulley. And pretty good size. And when you hold that up to a modern alternator. Mr. Al getting some work out this morning. You can see, I can do it here, you can see that, um, I can tell you that this one here makes a lot more power than this one. Weight-wise, the generator feels heavy. It's not dramatically more heavy, but it is heavier. More heavy, heavier. It is heavier, uh, but it's not dramatically so. 
So you say, well, what's the advantage? Well, the alternator is making t two or three times the electrical output. So to be able to do that and to still be slightly lighter, that's really, really impressive. Because making more power in an alternator generator is a function of the size of the magnetic fields, how many magnetic fields, the size of the stationary conductors, etc. So you can see this serpentine belt driven modern alternator here. So let's talk about the function of a charging system. Okay. So the main job of a charging system, the main function is to recharge the battery and provide a running voltage of about 13 and a half to about 14 and a half volts. We've got to recharge the battery after we start the engine because that's the, by far the greatest demand on the battery is that 110 to 150 amps to get the engine um, started to get that four stroke cycle initiated and running. So the battery will get recharged by the alternator and it's going to, um, sorry, the alternator is going to get recharged. Sorry, the battery is going to get recharged by the alternator. That's correct. And the alternator is going to provide this kind of voltage. So the alternator has to have more voltage than the battery has in order to push current back into the battery. So we're going to run an L a couple volts higher than what the battery already has. The alternator is going to change the current output to meet the demand of the engine. So if I turn on more devices, stereo, windshield wipers, high beams, fog lights, or low beams, fog lights, um, etc., the alternator will produce more power. If I start turning things off, it produces less power. So it's, it's an on-demand uh, electrical generator. It produces um, only what's needed. And that's good because the more demand you put on the alternator, the more demand it puts on the crankshaft. It resists the spinning of the crankshaft. And it affects gas mileage and power. And guess what? On modern cars, one of the advantages of having the computer controlling the voltage regulator, which controls the alternator output, is when I go to wide open throttle because I need to pass somebody, I can actually turn the alternator off so it's not charging, so it takes less power away from the crankshaft. If I've got a, a Ford EcoBoost and I've got a six-cylinder and, and I want that thing to just crank and, and driving a 15-passenger van with an EcoBoost, I'll shut the AC down, I'll shut the alternator down, put all the power during wide open throttle to the engine so the engine still makes power. When everything's working normally and I'm cruising down the highway, that EcoBoost gets great gas mileage uh, as a consequence because it's lighter, etc. All right, so next is alternator operation. So the alternator has two main components in it, and uh, that's one way to think about it. Those components are the rotor and the stator. So here's th pictures of three different rotors, and here's the picture of two stators. So the rotor and the stator. Here's a rotor in my hand right here. And here's a stator in my hand right here and a housing. Okay, so the rotor and the stator. So these two main components, like it says, are what is involved in this alternator functioning. So the rotor is a rotating magnetic field turned by the drive belt. So the pulley is going to, this is the back end, back end, back end. This is the front end, front end, front end. So on the front end, there's a threaded shaft, and that's where the pulley's going to bolt on on all three of these rotors. That um, threaded shaft will hold, again, the pulley um, so that on this rotor here, we have a way for a belt to drive the alternator. Okay? And we say it's a rotating magnetic field. Now, this is an electromagnet. We can make a magnet by materials uh, and make a permanent magnet. Or we can use a roll of, uh, of copper wire. This, in this case, it's actually solid copper wire. And some alternating cast iron claws for poles. We put in electricity into that coil. We make a magnetic field. And we spin that thing. We'll talk about it more. A stator here is a stationary set of three windings surrounding the rotor. A stationary set. So these are not spinning. This guy's spinning inside of this guy. But the stator is a group of three windings that are inside uh, inside the alternator and the, all, the rotor spinning. So you can see the three wires of the stator. And um, 
the three, they're actually three pairs of wires um, of the stator. All right. So our AC generator, our alternator theory looks like this, and we've got a nice cutaway here. You can see the case is cut like this. You can see the rotor north-south poles. You can see the rotator or the coil that's inside. This is the whole rotor uh, spinning. Um, the stator windings are up here, stator windings up here, and the voltage regulator and brushes and stuff are in the back. So this rotor is an electromagnet. Um, I've never heard of or never seen a, a permanent magnet alternator. I'm not saying it couldn't exist. I just don't know about it. So it's an electromagnet. And all that means is we put a current through that coil of wire at the north-south poles. We spin it and it makes a magnetic field. So a rotating electromagnet. Actually, if you spin it, it's an electromagnet. If you don't spin it, it's still an electromagnet. It's still be magnetic, but we spin it so it induces current into the stator. The output conductors, or stator, windings are stationary. We already said that. As the field rotates, and the field is short for magnetic field, as the field rotates, or its correct name is as the rotor rotates, we're going to induce current into the output windings, the stator. Induce means to put into. So as this rotor spins, it puts current into these stator windings. Okay. So a principle of electromagnetic induction is this. If, I, if my hand is a permanent magnet with a north and south pole, and I have an iron bar or a copper bar, and I just wave it right through, I go right through the magnetism. As it goes through, what happens as you approach it, current in this guy will flow in one direction. When it gets in the center of it, current will stop flowing. As you go out of it, it'll flow the opposite way. So if you wave a conductor through a magnetic field, you'll get an alternating current flowing one way than the other way. Okay, and that's true of, of any, mag, uh, any conductor that's passed through a magnetic field. So it's interesting. People have found ways to, to steal electricity from power companies, and I'm not recommending you do it, but if you have a big transmission pole near a creek and there's a big magnetic field around that, they would use the creek to spin a wheel that was a conductor, and because it's in that magnetic field, current would flow in the conductor I don't know how much current somebody can make. I don't know what it, how much they would get them, but I've heard of it. Maybe it's a fairy tale, but I have heard of it. Okay, so let's talk about AC output. So take this kind of a step at a time. So alternating current flows in one direction and then the other. And in your home electricity, we say you've got 110 volts, 60 hertz at your wall socket. That means you got 110 volts of alternating current voltage, and it's it's alternating at a at a speed or a frequency of 60 times a second, so 60 hertz. As the rotor turns into one stator winding, current is induced. So when the north pole is down and the south pole is up, current's flowing like this, powering that light bulb. And then when the same rotor pole moves into the other stator winding, current reverses direction. So when we flip the Magnet, so the north pole's up and the south pole's down. Now the current's going to flow in the opposite way. So we have one magnetic field spinning in an alternator, but we have uh, three, usually three, sometimes four stator conductors, all conducting um, electricity, but usually three um, stator conductors. Let's keep going here. So alternators create what we call rectified AC current. Rectified AC. Let me explain what rectified means. Cars use DC current. And the reason why they do is because we can't store AC current. We can store DC. So all storage batteries, uh, automotive lead acid battery, uh, batteries, <laughs> double A's, triple A's, C cells, D cells, um, you know, uh, laptop batteries, they're all DC storage batteries. So we need a storage battery to be able to get the starter motor spinning and initiate that, um, that uh, four-stroke cycle. DC flows in one direction, okay, but the alternator is making uh, AC current that's flowing in two directions, this way, then this way, this way, this way. It's switching at least out of the wall socket at 60 times a second. Alternator output must be rectified or changed from AC to DC. Now you say, why don't we use the word change? Because... Rectified is a, is a descriptive term of taking 
uh, current flow in two directions and putting it into one direction, but changed is sort of layman's terms. So the alternator output must be rectified or changed from AC to DC. In order to do this, we use several pairs of diodes, several pairs of diodes. Diodes are one-way electrical check valves to accomplish this. Several pairs of diodes in order to accomplish this. So this uh, diode tree here and this group of diodes and this voltage regulator, this one actually has one, two, three, four positive diodes and then one, two, three, four negative diodes. So it's got four pairs of diodes. All you can see is this raised area here and raised area here. On the back side, you can see where those diodes, the end of the diode, one, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, where they're soldered onto there, okay? So a diode's a one-way electrical check valve. Here's another group of diodes, and this one's actually was out of a Subaru that wasn't charging, and it's got some burned diodes. I don't know how easy it'll be for you to see that. Let me try. Yeah, you can see the burn little holes down there on that diode right there. Let me go over here and get it real close. Yeah, okay. All right, here we go. So next, number four is diode. So a diode is a one-way electrical check valve, and current will come in on a positive flow, go through the diode, go through the base, go to ground. But when it tries to... Uh, reverse polarity, which is re polarity is direction of flow current, it won't let current flow. So it only lets it flow in, through, and the ground, and won't let it come out and go this way. So it's a one-way electrical check valve. You could say it kind of traps electricity to only flow in one direction. So this diode, let's look at these two pictures, the two circuits. When current's flowing this way through the bulb and then through the diode, it allows current flow, the light lights. If the alternator switches direction of current flow, which you call change of polarity, it blocks it. It won't let current flow, and the light doesn't light up. So if we graph this, this is an oscilloscope graph. It's a waveform of the voltage. So what you have on the um, y-axis is voltage, both positive and negative. The x-axis is time. So you've got a positive current flow, and then a negative, and then a positive, then a negative, then a positive, then a negative. Well, the diode lets it go positive and then doesn't let the negative current flow flow. So it just goes like that, like that, like that, okay? Uh, but by the way, that's not really what happens. What we do is, in an alternator, we, through a series of diodes, get this negative current flow to be up here. So instead of going like this, it goes dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, etc. And we, we capture this negative flow, directional flow, and turn it into a positive flow. So, and we'll get to that. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So here's an alternator deconstructed. Two end frames, one here, one here, put together with bolts, bolt together. On the inside, you have an, a rotor, rotating magnetic field, a series of stationary conductors called a stator. Back here, you've got a series of diodes, and sometimes the voltage regulator is on the outside. Um, more, moder more commonly now, it's right on the inside. You've got a couple of brushes that touch the slip rings of the rotor to bring current in. This is an older alternator that fans on the outside, and you've got a drive pulley up there, although you don't see the drive pulley. Mess. Well, I guess that's it right there. Okay. So let's talk more specifically about the rotor. I think there's going to show a picture here, does it? Yeah, okay. So the rotor is a series of field windings mounted on a shaft, or really just one coil of wire that we call a field winding. That would be more accurate. So it's just a roll of wire. Now, that wire right here, you can see the lines, um, is solid copper. Okay, now we'll get to it in just a second but it's insulated, so the wire windings don't touch each other. So when you look inside there and you see that wire in there, that, that copper wire, which you can see, it looks like it's touching each other, but it's actually got a clear plastic coating on it, so it's insulated um, 
from each other. Then you have two claw-shaped pole pieces. This is the one piece, cast iron. This is the other piece. And those are going to make our alternating north-south poles, okay, that are going to dramatically organize and increase the magnetic field. Those fingers are the north-south poles, those fingers right here. This one here, this one here, this here, this here. Those fingers are our alternating north-south poles. So there they are. These guys here and here and here, there, okay? And by the way, that's the weight of the alternators, that rotor. This, this, These two big cast iron pieces, that's the weight of the rotor. That's what really makes it have some weight when it pushes back just a little bit so you can see the whole thing here. Okay, um, as the rotor spins, alternating polarity produces alternating current. So as it spins, this change of, of um, we get a change in magnetic current flow as we spin the alternator in the stator, okay? So the slip rings are mounted on the rotor shaft. I'm going to show you the picture here, get right to it. So what you've got is these two copper slip rings that have these two um, graphite brushes uh, resting on them. So this is spinning and these are stationary, are mounted on the rotor shaft. This is how current gets into the rotor warnings to make the electromagnetism. So this is coming from the battery positive. This is going to the battery negative. Now, what's in this circuit is a voltage regulator, which is limiting how much current can go in here. So the voltage regulator says, okay, we need this much amperage. Put this much amperage to the alternator, this much current flow, and that will control the output of the alternator. So an external source of electricity, a battery, is needed to excite the field. So the battery gets it going. And then the alternator will self-excite itself, meaning it'll self-power the rotor once it's spinning. But the battery gets it initially charging. So we're going to, and when we put current to that rotor, we make electromagnetism. We spin it by the windings, we make power. The faster we spin it, the more power we make. If we increase the number of, of wires, wrappings of wire in the rotor, we get a stronger magnetic field and more output. If we increase the stator wires, we get more output. If we spin it faster, we get more output. Four-wheel drive guys will downsize their alternator pulleys to spin it faster to get more output. Okay, let's continue. So now we'll look at our brushes. The brushes ride on the slip ring. So here's a picture. Let me show it to you again. So I just showed this to you, but I'm showing it more up close. So these brushes, this third component here of an alternator's construction, contact the slip ring. So they ride on the slip ring. They provide a sliding electrical connection. So power is coming in. It actually, this is actually touching here, going out to ground. We feed battery current into the slip rings and rotor windings, at least when we're first starting the car. And then the alternator is producing power, and it will actually put power in here. Springs hold the brushes in contact with the slip rings. So I'll show you a set of brushes. Um, I'm grabbing some here. Give me just a moment. Grab the brushes. So here's a pair of brushes. You can see they're spring loaded. And they're going to ride right against. I'm going to get this focused here. They're going to ride right against the um, alternator rotor. Here's another alternator, and you can look right in the back end of this guy here, and the brushes are right inside here. You can't really see. There you can kind of see one riding against that rotor, so as I spin this rotor here, you can see that it's spinning. It's riding on that brush. A little hard to see in that, that guy, okay? So they're spring-loaded. It's a wearable contact. So obviously these are eventually going to wear out. So a normal cause of an alternator failure is the brushes wear out. And it grooves the alternator slip rings. And, and then we've got to um, open that thing up and change the slip rings, and we'll go from there. Okay. So this just shows a picture 
of the slip rings, a real simplified picture touching those two hopper contacts. Which I want you to notice is here's the wrapping of, of wire inside the rotor. Notice that one end of the wire comes out and is attached to this slip ring. One end of the wire comes out and is attached to this slip ring. And so this whole assembly is spinning. So power comes in, goes through the coil, goes out, goes to ground, and makes an electromagnet. So that's a real simplified picture of the alternator rotor with the two brushes. Um, all alternators only have two brushes. Never seen anything different. If there is something different, never seen it in cars. Um, they are replaceable. Um, they usually have to be soldered in. I have personally rebuilt and replaced countless sets of, of brushes. Probably done, I don't know, 25 or 30 or 40 in my life. Lots of them. Um, so next is the rectifier. So the rectifier is six. To eight, I want to get the whole picture up here. So the rectifier is six to eight diodes. One, two, three, four, four. This one has six. They're used to convert the stator output to direct current. So the stator is going to collect the alternating current, and then it's going to change that alternating current into direct current. So this guy right here with those four humps there, and then those four humps here. This is a more modern one. This is four pairs of alternator um, diodes. We're going to provide what we call full wave rectification. That is, each one of those waves, because you get a wave in each pair of diodes, is going to be rectified. So no longer is it a sine wave, but we take the top half and we take that bottom half and we put it on top. So I'll draw you a little picture so you can see what it looks like in just a moment. We're going to change both positive and negative outputs into DC current. So I'll go over like this onto the board over here, and I'll probably show you this in another way later. But let's say we have a XY axis, voltage this way, time this way. So this is what a sine wave of alternating output look like. Sorry, it's not really the best spot for you to see that. And then in another stator winding, we have another sine wave of electricity. And in a third one, we have another winding. So we've got three windings of alternating current output. So this is three phase output. So when we when we um, put it through the diodes, all these negative well, try to make them go away. All these negative parts go away, and now we take the so now here's the we get the twice as much out of that phase, and then twice as much. I do it right, yeah. Out of that phase, sorry, I didn't draw it very well. It actually should look more symmetrical than this. And this is like this, like that. And so we've got now three fully rectified uh, phases of alternating current power. All right, let's get set back up over here. All right, there we go.